consider supporting this podcast on Patreon. On this episode of the What is Asia podcast, I interview Norman Joshua, a PhD student at Northwestern University in Illinois, to discuss the rise of authoritarianism and militarization in Indonesia in the 1950s and 60s, as well as the legacy that was left behind by the authoritarian New Order regime after its collapse in 1998. Norman, thanks for joining us. Sam, um, pleasure to be here. So you study a topic that's a little bit unusual for most uh, Americans, which is Indonesia, uh, but a particular aspect of Indonesia, which is authoritarianism. And you try to frame authoritarianism in a unique way, which we'll get into in a moment. Uh, first of all, though, I wanted to know if you could sort of set the stage for us. You talk about this political transition that happens in Indonesia in 1966, where the president of Indonesia relinquishes all of his power to a general in the Indonesian armed forces. Can you give some context to what's happening here? For example, uh, talking about colonialism in Indonesia, uh, when was that period? Uh, all of that to sort of set the stage. Okay, uh, thank you, Nakota. So uh, maybe we can start with um, like the story of Indonesia, Indonesia itself. How did it came to into being? Because um, particularly before the uh, 1945, there was no Indonesia. Per se. Indonesia is more like India in the sense that it was a uh, uh, um, an agglomeration of uh, um, of uh, many regional polities that uh, exist in um, a lot of our islands because we also have a lot of islands, thirty thousand more, and we're the largest archipelago in the area, in the world. Sorry, and um, it's um, after the Dutch came and uh, started to uh, colonize the the, the area. The, uh, in the early 19th century, um, they created this new um, um, colonial state, which was the Netherlands East Indies. And the Netherlands East Indies um, existed roughly until the 1942 when the Japanese arrived and uh, invaded uh, the Netherlands Indies and occupied it. And um, that was the end of the colonial society and polity as we know of. And um, after the Japanese surrender in 1945, we had this um, we had this revolution with uh, uh, spans from 1945 until 1949, and this long revolution has been um, like super complicated and very um, uh, substantial. Substantially, um, in uh, uh, changed the makeup of Indonesian society at that time. So, and um, after the revolution ended, we had this. Uh, we had uh, our um, leader was Sukarno, and he, he was very famous at the time, uh, um, domestically and also globally, because Sukarno was uh, viewed as one of the most um, uh, most um, outspoken strongmen of the um, uh, then they say the third world. And um, in 1965, we had this um, attempted coup by the Indonesian Communist Party. And um, communism in Indonesia has always been the, a strong force um, that has supported Indonesian nationalism uh, since the colonial and the revolutionary periods. And um, this um, attempted coup was, um, was viewed by the army, which was in the right side of the political spectrum at the time, if I may say, um, to uh, but do a preemptive strike against them. So this uh, 1965 drama was uh, roughly this uh, very uh, big turning point in Indonesian history um, that basically changed the the nation's uh, the nation's story after that. And in the thing about 1965, because you uh, started with asking how Sukarno uh, gave up, just gave up his powers into 
uh, uh, to Suharto, which was back then he was an army uh, officer general. Um, it's a it's a very complicated situation in the in the in the kind that you just cannot figure out who was the the culprit with a lot of um, just a, a lot of his history is very hard to pinpoint one cause of the uh, the incident itself right and uh, 1965 have always been a, a favorite um, topic in Indonesian historiography and it's uh, it's Southeast Asian historiography as well and of course it's very related to the Cold War as well with um, how the uh, American influence in the U and in Indonesian armies also influenced that and the I started this project, uh, my uh, dissertation project, from the um, the idea that I want to depart from all of that because I don't really want to tell another story about this political change in '65 and how the how the communists they they were massacred, yeah, um, not, notably in, um, in the 1965 in the, uh, after the attempted coup and how after the army took power, we have uh, a lot of bloodshed in Indonesia, and that's very well recorded in in the, um, in Cold War historiography as well. So, in the terms like uh, very well, like um, uh, Allende in Chile, uh, actually uh, that that operation when Pinochet took over uh, power in Latin America in, in Chile was called Operation Jakarta because Jakarta was. Uh, Indonesia was so successful to the Western, uh, um, to the uh, Western uh, ideologues at the time, and they saw that we uh, this was a successful story for um, for the West. Uh, for so, so yeah, yeah. So we go over a lot of points here, which might be a bit overwhelming for some of the people in our audience. So let's uh, step back a little bit. You mentioned a national revolution. Can you give a brief synopsis of uh, what were the causes of that revolution and what was the outcome of that revolution? So basically Indonesia had this um, nationalism movement since the early uh, 20th century, yeah? 1910, 1920s, we had, um, uh, they call it the period of uh, pergerakan or uh, roughly translates to movement. And this nationalism force was consisted of um, uh, na uh, nationalists and communist nationalists, and also the, the uh, Islamic ideas. So these three forces were the main, let's say, the main political ideologies in Indonesian nationalism. And this is, this can roughly be uh, 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 extended into uh, much of the 1960s. Uh, before 1965, because after 65 you have um, uh, the communist um, uh, massacre, and after the Japanese uh, successfully invaded uh, the East Indies, the whole idea of colonial um, um, peace and order that was managed by the Dutch, they every, everything collapsed, and after this, this collapse, the society became. Um, the society was also um, radic radicalized uh, by the Japanese because the Japanese um, military occupation uh, geared the society into a uh, society that was uh, militarized per se because they were uh, trained in militias. They were, uh, the economy was designed to support uh, war efforts and um, even cultural policies were also support, uh, designed to support the, the, the war effort against the West. And this, this was in World War II. And when the Japanese rendered in 1945, the um, Indonesian nationalists declared um, independence immediately. And this declaration of independence uh, um, immediately paved the way to the, to the emergence of uh, uh, paramilitary groups all over Java. And Java was the center of the revolution at the time. So, Java is the main island, and a lot of these parliamentary groups basically just uh, fight for power, and eventually the Indonesian nationalist um, regime 
emerged from this kind of like chaotic uh, moment of revolution. And this was the early 1945, 1946. And after that, we also had, um, so the Dutch tried to, um, try to re reoccupy Indonesia uh, after we, uh, the, the Indonesian government declared independence. And um, the Dutch, um, the Dutch were in Java at the time and all over the archipelago as well. And we had two main, um, two main uh, wars in a sense that because the Dutch call it uh, police actions, uh, very, very much similar to how the French do it in, uh, in, in the China. And these police actions basically were the, uh, were the warring periods of the revolution because between that, a lot of, uh, a lot of this was uh, made through uh, diplomatic efforts as well. And during the revolution, uh, basically the stage was set for almost a lot of the, um, of the uh, structure and, and patterns of Indonesian political and societal conflicts at, uh, in the 1950s because we had, again, post-war, you have a lot of uh, weapons lying around and a lot of uh, militia groups uh, fighting for power. It's very easy to become chaotic. So there's that. So following this national revolution where the Japanese and Dutch are no longer there, uh, the people of Indonesia declare their independence. Um, in the materials you sent me, you talk a little bit about what are called liberal and guided democracies. So I have two questions here. Uh, first of all, what is it? Uh, wh what is that liberal and guided democracy? And also, in part of your thesis, you talk about the militarization of society. Uh, so was there truly a period of liberalization in Indonesia during this time? Or was it just something that was nominal? There's, um, this is the, the most interesting part of uh, 1950s Indonesia, which is in my sense, it's very under research because 1950s Indonesia was uh, widely viewed as a period of, um, of experimentation in terms of how the how the Indonesian uh, society uh, and uh, and elites uh, try to organize a properly working state because we in the 1950s we have this period of uh, federal Indonesia. So Indonesia was not a unitary state and it was federal because of course Indonesia was uh, very large and the, uh, there, the, there's so many um, ethnic groups in all the islands and Indonesia was actually meant for federalism. And there was a, a very short period where we had a, a, a federal, federal system but this federal system basically just uh, collapsed after one year, and the um, the the liberal democracy um, moniker was uh, put by Herbert Fee in order to aim in order to show that this period was that again that period of experimentation uh, by Indonesian elites about how to how to form a state and how to uh, how to um, how to govern basically. And um, it's um, distinct from the other periods and the current period in Indonesia, especially contemporary Indonesia, because at that time we, our um, head of government was a uh, prime minister in the, in the Western model. In the, so very, um, we try to uh, copy the, uh, the, the Dutch model because a lot of Indonesian jurists and um, a lot of them were uh, Dutch educated elites. And these elites, uh, basically we had a parliamentary system at that time, but the parliamentary system, um, again, collapsed until uh, after 1959 when Sukarno, the president, um, uh, recentered power through um, emergency law. And these are um, the, the main um, elements of what I uh, study in the 1950s because even when the when the elites were experimenting in how to properly govern the state and how to um, uh, properly manage 
uh, democracy at the time, there was this undercurrent of uh, society at the time because this was a post-war society and it was still chaotic. So there's a lot of, uh, of armed groups running around, brigands basically, there are robber groups and rebellions that run around uh, Java and these, these groups became a uh, uh, threat to order in a sense and it uh, eventually became like the became a reasoning for how authoritarianism came up. So one of the main elements of your thesis, as I mentioned in the beginning, uh, is that the uh, president of Indonesia relinquishes his power to uh, one of the major generals in the military. This goes hand in hand with another argument that you make, that this isn't something sudden that happened. Uh, it, you know, it's not like it went from Indonesia having a democracy and jumping straight into militarization. Uh, you talk about how this is a gradual process, and I assume this is uh, part of the reason uh, why the president gave up his power, because by 1966, it became so apparent to him uh, how militarized society had become. So I have two questions. What do you mean when you use the term militarization of society? And then after answering that, uh, what were some of the institutions or elements that were used in order to militarize society? Okay, um, I think um, in terms of the concept of militarization, I borrow this uh, a lot from um, anthropologists and uh, actually European historians that uh, says that militarization as a it's actually a social process that prepares the society for uh, production of violence. And this was from Michael Gear. And uh, um, there's actually um, also an uh, American historian in, in Northwestern that talks about this. Uh, that's uh, Michael Sherry, talks about how, the, uh, how it's the Second World War never went away in American society, like the, uh, the New Deal state and how the this, uh, the United States just became replaced by the military industrial complex and so forth. And um, in, 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 um, in Indonesia, this idea is actually encapsulated in this revolution that never ended. Actually, one of the most famous speeches by Sukarno was um, say that um, let us continue the revolution. Uh, the revolution it's not has not yet ended if we we don't have uh, so we managed to uh, kick out the dutch but the revolution has not has not ended yet that's what he said at the time. and um in indonesia this this um idea of revolution or struggle or uh, perjuangan as they say struggle is very and um uh, very entrenched in society at the time and this is uh, also part of how the um, society itself was easily um, organized or co-opted in a sense to became militarized in, after the um, authoritarianism and this was this uh, a lot very a long process that is not just top down because a lot of the again a lot of the historiography that on Indonesia, and on authoritarianism per se, looks at how how the um, the military try to impose their values upon society, but uh, they don't really talk about how the society actually requests their value or uh, the, the demand side of this uh, equation. Right there was a supply side and uh, and the demand side, and I'm trying to highlight this demand side by looking at the 1950s again with all those. Uh, 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 chaos on the ground, and how this basically geared society to uh, pave the way for the army to take power. And it's more than important because the in the 1950s and even now, actually the in the, the armed forces is not a very organized group because again we see this this go back again with, to the revolution because. We, so the armed forces came as an amalgamation of a lot of these uh, militia groups. 
So this is a very familiar story for us who look who studies um, East Asia as well, because the the story of warlordism in uh, in China reflects this. And a very similar thing happened in Indonesia because um, uh, the in, so the the very um, the very consistent uh, myth that has been re uh, repeated by the official army historiography was that the army rose with the people, so emerged from the people. And it's in, in a sense, it was true because we didn't have an army at that then. And so the revolution just happened like that. And we didn't have like a continental army or we didn't have like a national revolutionary army in the, in the like in China. So there's that, and um, it's um, very important to see how actually the society itself has this uh, demand that they, when they face, uh, they came face to face with the chaos and the um, um, widespread rebellions in the ground and um, uh, uh, armed crimes because still a lot of um, small arms um, was uh, uh, circulating in society after them. They um, came to ask for the army to come. And just to touch on the second part of my question, could you talk about some of the institutions or elements uh, through which the military was able to militarize, militarize society uh, in the way that you talk about it? I think, um, yeah, uh, in terms of institution, I think this is the um, the um, historical part of the um, of the thesis comes in because, all, as we say, um, my argument is uh, in history we we have we have this uh, way of emphasizing uh, continuities and change, right? And in 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 my story, it's uh, more of a continuity argument because in Indonesian um, institutions, we we actually inherit a lot from the Dutch. Even if we, even uh, when we had a revolution, a five-year one, that spent five years, uh, we still had to inherit a lot of the institution from the Dutch. And uh, at first, this was the legal institutions, and there, this is the um, the emergency law that I uh, focus on in this. Uh, in this aspect, because we in actually inherit a lot of the laws from the Dutch, and emergency our emergency laws was also inherited from the Dutch, and it was again it was first primarily designed for a colonial society and colonial state, and it was recycled into um, um, into a, a nation state, and it um, it paved, it again it paved the way for militarization. And um, the second part would be the um, the military science, in a sense. And this is like a, a little bit of um, how um, science and technology historiography affects us. Um, is that how how colonial counterinsurgency methods were again repackaged and reused by Indonesian military because the idea of, um, um, so the Indonesian army was not primarily, primarily designed or geared for, um, for invading other countries. It's actually primarily designed to defend itself from uh, internal rebellions and internal enemies. And this is a very, uh, this is actually the main characteristic of a colonial army. It was designed to poli as a police army. And during the 50s, there was this huge um, debate on how, how the Indonesian um, army had to uh, go forward with their own uh, strategies and doctrine. And during this uh, long debates, um, they eventually came up and again, recycled the colonial, um, colonial aspects as well. As well. Mm. So one thing that you mentioned in the materials that you sent me is that over time, a large number of Indonesians came to accept this uh, militarization of society, uh, if I understand that correctly. Was it because of the chaos and then they just said, okay, well, we want 
some semblance of order? Um, or were there reasons besides that that led to the majority of society accepting militarization? So um, um, in 1950s, after the revolution ended, there was this sense of um, um, disillusionment of on how the um, how the state and society was operating at that time because again this is a post-war society that was re- still uh, was still in a period of construction and the economy has not been going very well for them and this um, a lot of this became um, uh, found their uh, a lot of these ideas get, uh, found their outlets in this um, rebellions, right? And we had a lot of rebellions, like in in Java, we had in West Java the uh, long Darul Islam or Islamic State rebellion, and this is the if if we can put um, these uh, rebellions in this um, like in this uh, scheme of this is an Islamic rebellion or nationalistic rebellion or communist rebellion. It's even though it these categories are not um, mutually exclusive. It was this uh, it, this Islamic rebellion that uh, runs from started in a revolution, but then it goes through 1960s in, in in Java, and it very it affected the countryside, affected the society uh, very uh, significantly. A lot of the um, a lot of villages were uh, burned down by these groups, and um, a lot of um, um, roads and um, um, railways were, uh, were cannot be used because um, of these widespread guns, and um, this is just one uh, one example of it. Right, and we also have these other uh, rebellions in the other islands, and it was it was really a time of uh, nation building, uh, uh, actually, and again in time of nation building, a lot, certainly a lot of of people who do not agree with how the uh, nation is going, they come out. And the problem with uh, the state at this time that the Indonesian state was a weak one. It cannot project its power um, uh, properly because the army was still trying to figure their uh, um, uh, things out. And um, But then the society has been... Um, expecting more because they fought in the revolution and they they thought that they 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 had to achieve this they already achieved independence so we should live uh, um, back in uh, peace and order and they didn't get it at that time so there was this uh, widespread uh, sense of disappointment that is very uh, 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 um, very uh, so disappointment was in, in the air at the time, and this is very much reflected in a lot of the debates and um, um, letters in, in a lot of the newspapers at that time. And um, so, this th- there were a there were parts of the society that actually um, actually. Uh, wants the army to take over in a sense, you know, in the army to take over in the sense that um, to restore order. And this was uh, very evident in West Java in the, the area that I uh, um, I focus on. So I focus in the main three areas in Java, so uh, West, Central, and East Java. And this paved the way for the, um, again, the use of uh, counterinsurgency methods by the army at the time. When uh, much later, they also designed a lot of the um, um, the um, um, so the we had a program called the Abri Masuk Desa or Civic Mission actually Civic Action Programs, and the Abri Masuk Desa means that the the army goes into the um, into the village to basically um, win the hearts and minds of the people. And this is like a basic um, counterinsurgency method that has been um, circulating in the 
military science, um, scientific society from colonial period into into the Cold War period, right? As we know, because this is a very uh, very um, significant in Vietnam as well. So there's that, and when the uh, when the army had uh, have the authority to do that. It's it's very easy to just take over take over power. I have a couple more questions before we wrap up. Uh, one thing that uh, I really like about your research is that, as I mentioned at the beginning, you reframe authoritarianism in a different light. You don't focus so much on the military violence and those aspects of uh, a rising authoritarian power. You look a lot at social institutions, how the military connected with the minds of the average person in Indonesia. And I'm curious, and it's called the New Order Regime, correct? Yeah. What is the legacy of the New Order Regime and how is it thought about today? Uh, how do the effects of the New Order Regime still reverberate in modern day society? Because uh, if my understanding is correct, the newer regime is no longer existent, correct? Yeah. So Suharto fell in 1998 um, during the Asian financial crisis. And um, of course, the most, so for, um, for current day Indonesia, the biggest legacy of the military authoritarian regime um, Suharto or the new order regime was uh, corruption. So crony capitalism was the whole basis of the of uh, state society, society relations during the um, new order period, and um, corruption was widespread. So during the new order, we had um, we had uh, order in a sense. So we. Um, we phase out from this revolutionary society into a, um, a more uh, pacified society, actually, because the army was ruling. And we had a very um, high economic growth at that time. So in 1970s, Indonesia was uh, viewed as one of the Asian tigers as well. But then it all collapsed in 1998. Because the the, the the foundations of these um, economic growth and uh, and, um, and order was uh, so fragile, and um, the now in after 1998 we still have a lot of people that um, that actually calls for a um, so. A, so a lot of people say that it's 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 better during the new order regime, right? Because we had we were prosperous, there were peace, and nowadays it's it's not that um, optimistic in a sense. So a but lot still, of people I mean, actually um, in, a, a lot of people actually wish they could go back to that older regime. Yeah, there there is a um, there is a um, a, a stream. And it's so. I think this this also relates with the global uh, rise with of uh, of um, right wing politics and populism. In uh, I don't really like to use that term populism because it's it's very hard to define. And um, in in the world, right, and with 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 Trumpism and 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 everything we see in Europe as well. And um, it's. It's there, so the stream is still there, even if the new order has been has been disappearing. And of course, the elites, um, a lot of the current elites in Indonesia are still uh, they uh, still um, educated in the new order period, and so the shadow still remains. And also, the most um, the most significant. Um, significant um, heritage from the New Order regime is that we still have this kind of fear with uh, communism, even though the Cold War has ended so well, very long ago. So the the law that uh, banned the Communist Party, so after 1966, we we uh, passed a law that banned uh, communism, Marxism, Leninism, and et cetera. In Indonesia, it's you. You cannot just come to a university and suddenly teach Marx. It's it's just not allowed. It's illegal here. 
and the law is still there. It's not. It's haven't been changed. And Indonesian historiography is still still have that uh, view of. Um, and this is the official historiography. Still have that view of how the um, the the Kremlins were uh, the the main traitors of the of the um, of the perjuangan of the struggle, and it's still there. So we still have a lot of uh, work to do in, in that part. And I think one of the ways is to understand that is to look at how in the um, how in the 1950s it was it was actually uh, it was actually that chaotic you know it's not it's not only the again the, there was the communists and there was the the islamists and also the nationalists as well but these groups were fighting each other and it's but it's very hard to just pinpoint this okay the one cause the, of problem in indonesia was the communists it's it's it's, it's never like that right in history and um, um, the same also applies to 1965, uh, where it was not only the the army's, um, let's say, how the army actually designed that uh, um, designed that uh, tragedy, but it's also part of how the society participates in that as well. Because in a lot of the regions. The, a lot of the massacres were actually not done by the army themselves. They were done by these uh, paramilitaries, crime groups. And there's a very famous um, movie, Act of Killing, by Joshua Oppenheimer, if you're more uh, interested in that, that, is, um, that talks about this, how the, um, they participated, the, a lot of these groups participated in that. So, it's very complicated, and again, with with the Polish history, it's uh, always that. And the thing is, um, these these um, these institutions actually remain with us until now, uh, like through the regimes, through through the Sukarno period, through the New Order period, and now in we call now as a, a post reformasi period. So 19, 1998 was a reformation period. So this is a post uh, post reformasi period. We still have the emergency law. They, they haven't changed it. So our, our emergency law now is still the 1950s one, which was adopted from the colonial one. And second, we still have the the um, counterinsurgency doctrine in the army. So the counterinsurgency doctrine is still uh, using the um, the old colonial influence one. And third, we still have the um, the societal groups. So a lot of the um, paramilitaries and crime groups are, are still there, and there are still major actors in in Indonesian politics and society, and they are still uh, influential. So this is uh, again, this is um, how I think um, militarization has um, like a, a remained long in Indonesia, and 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 I think will remain until uh, in the foreseeable future. So just very briefly before we wrap up here, uh, I ask this question of every guest that we have on. Um, if someone is watching this and they're interested in knowing more um, about Indonesia or about this subject, uh, what are one or two books that you could recommend for people to read? So a general overview of Indonesian history that uh, the kind of like... Uh, Jonathan Spence in China kind of uh, book is by Merle Rickles. So M-E-R-L-E-R-E-C-K-L-E-F-S. -E um, so he, um, the title is uh, Modern History of Indonesia. And, and this is like the, uh, this is the to go book to understand how the, um, uh, the general history goes through Indonesia and it, uh, successfully incorporates a lot of these themes in Indonesian historiography. That uh, these important themes in Indonesian historiography, and um, um, there's also the um, um, on um, on new order Indonesia, like um, Michael Fatikiotis' uh, uh, books. Um, he talks about uh, authoritarianism, and he talks about 
um, how the new order society and state and society relations at the time. And these these generalist books are, I think, for Indonesia, it's quite um, quite well written, you know, and very accessible. And it's it's not that um, um, it's not that contentious in uh, as in, uh, for instance, like in in American history or in um, or in European history. So I think this is these are uh, the two two uh, two books that I would recommend, like uh, more requests and. Um, uh, my to get these books. Well, thank you, Norman, for joining us on this episode of the What is Asia podcast. And for our audience, you can go to our YouTube channel uh, to watch more content or go to nicodadefonso.com. This concludes season two of our podcast. We will see you in August as we begin season three.